Hello and welcome to the Ark at Headingley for the latest edition of Back Chat. Four men in a pub talking about rugby league. It is cutting edge television. Joining us this week, legend at his own lunchtime, it's Gary Schofield. Also from the Times and Sunday Times newspaper, it's Chris Irvin. And taking life seriously, but never too seriously, Phil Kaplan from 4020 Magazine, who's had his birthday this week, his 28th birthday. He, you wouldn't imagine it, in would each you? Leg. Congratulations. Thank you. Right, let's get started and let's start with what for me has been the game of the season so far Wigan against Warrington. Chris Irvin, did we see the two grand finalists when they came together? Probably a third of the way into the regular season, you would say yes, it's early days, but Wigan and Warrington have set the way in terms of the league table, and I think in terms of the performance, particularly Warrington's, was, was, was top draw, and particularly one player for 25 minutes, Chris Sando, mm -hmm. uh, the Aussie halfback, was sensational created three wonderful tries, one with a short pass for Ben Curry, one with a long looping pass out to Tom Lynham, another fantastic kick on the fly straight to the bread basket of Kevin Penny, three great tries, then he tore a hamstring, but it was it was a great performance and Warrington continued it as well, uh, they're down on troops, they only had 15 players for the, for the second half, but, but they fought the way through it, third match of Easter, and I thought they, 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 mm. they're setting the benchmark at the moment. You're talking about down on troops, and Wigan were down on troops as well, mm. weren't they? You, you know, no Sam Tompkins yet, Michael McAlorum is out, George Williams missing again, Sean Lachlan didn't play for the whole of the second half. Yeah. That's your spine gone. So to get as close as they did, they did really well. Yeah, it is, Dave. But also, uh, you mentioned that we've seen the two grand finals. I think we have, to be honest with you. But there's two, there's two points on that game. Warrington was up for the challenge from Wigan, you know, with their bullying tactics and they like to roll over the top of you. Warrington were up for that challenge. But a second point for Wigan is, and I think it's a concern for Sean Wayne, it's quite clear, it's the creativity. Mm. You know, that creativity is not there for them. So if they are looking, realistically, not just to maybe win the grand final, but also to get there, they need to start scoring more points. But if you, if you start the season, you look at where your points are going to come from, your creativity is going to come from, you're going to go A, George Williams, and B, Sam Tompkins, Absolutely. and neither of them are available. But yeah. I think the difference in the two teams is the utility value that Warrington have got, that you mentioned Sam now going off and how crucial he's been, and obviously a front runner for Man of Steel, let's hope he isn't out for too long. But then, of course, they bring Stefan Ratchford into the role, and, and it doesn't disrupt them in any way. You sort of touched upon Ben Curry's try. He's the other guy that is yeah. absolutely on fire for them at the moment. Fantastic to see from an English rugby league point of view. But it's almost as if last season's trials and tribulations have been the making of Warrington this season. And Sandow being there and just being part of that culture and learning the British way is absolutely exceptional. And then, of course, Gidley alongside him, just pulling the strings. It, it, it's a really well-balanced team that has great utility. It value. is, and also the, the, the great thing for the Warrington players, they've got a coach who lets them play, who lets them express themselves. You know, they know they're not going to go in the dressing room or they're not going to be messages coming on and get told off for what they're trying to achieve. And, uh, but the, the great thing for Warrington was the defence capabilities that they know they can keep a quality team at Wigan, but plus as well, they can score tries with the quality of what they've got, not just at half-back, but also to the centres and the wingers. Well, what about the confidence well, of Ryan Atkins try? Yeah, very, well, yeah. Now that just shows what, what's running through a team when you can slip the ball between your legs and... Yeah. and and the, the, the other surprise. player who's really come to the fore, he had a poor, poor by his standards, poor season last season, former Man of Steel, Daryl Clark, yeah. Yeah. seems to be back into level. form. Yeah. Uh, I think Chris Hill plays a vital role in that. I think Chris Hill is a, is a great leader. He's shown himself a great leader as well. Ashton Sims is on form. And we've touched on Ben Curry as well. Uh, and Joe Westerman's in there as well. I, I, I do think that forward pack, uh, complementing what they've got outside, Key to it's the half-backs, key is half-backs, and, and they look very balanced. Yeah. You know, you've got somebody like Matty Russell again who's come back He's into the squad. He's another one who's really and, played and well. uh, Looked at when he first came through, Scottish international, is he too slight? Where's he going to play? Is he a fast winger? Is he a linking full-back? Is he even a half-back? Well, now he seems settled in. Wherever they play him, he's going to do them a job. He made more metres so than exciting. any other player, didn't yeah, he, in that Such game. an exciting... Is, and is, brave. Is Tony Smith, in the last year of a contract, going to become an issue? As he, Do Warrington need to sort that out? Because, I mean, people are linking him with Hulk AR, um, Catalan. We, 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 we spoke with uh, Roger Draper, the, the Warrington chief executive, after the game, and he's kind of talked about that tongue in cheek but said no we want him to stay we want yeah. him to stay so do they need to sort that out do you think i think so dear as well but uh, i think one interesting factor here is going to be because myself and phil you know we're leeds fans it's as simple as that you? but but it's a way we're leeds fans but uh, it's a style of play you know what uh, what the supporters want and the st Helens fans aren't happy with their sort of style of play and these pressure on kieran cunningham here so so for St Tellen to get back to that sort of style of play, Tony Smith always encourages that he likes that open side of rugby league. It wouldn't surprise me if Tony is going to leave Warrington, that St Tellen's 
are in there going for Tony Smith to bring back that sort of open, attractive rugby league, what the St. Helens Club want and what the St. Helens supporters want as well. That's, that's no, called gossip. Maybe, <laughs> but maybe you'd encourage that. If he's in the last year of his contract and he's going here, there and everywhere, maybe Tony would encourage that. You, you don't think he's got an agent by any chance, do you? I don't know, but I think, I think he probably will stay at Warrington. He's been there. He's been there a long time. He's got a very seven, close seven, relationship seven. with Simon Moran. I, yeah. I think that if they move to that level now where they are going to win a grand final, there's absolutely no way they'd want to let him go. It's building a dynasty, isn't yeah, but, it? Yeah, but it, it is building a dynasty, but also as well, how long has Tony been there now? What, five, seven six, seven years. Seven he's been there seven years so it may be time for a change for him maybe time for a new challenge and what better I, challenge is to I, bring that sort of rugby league what's but I think that, because, that new like challenge stuff. has been turning around this current team from sixth mm. last year to potential grand final winners the recruitment's been excellent I think he's got all the players he wanted um, I think the challenge for him will be to take that on and, and win more if, you, he, if he actually get, does achieve this year, you get a sense about Warrington as a club mm. that they've really, that they they are really kind of leading the way now in mm. uh, in the professionalism off the field, what goes on off the field, yeah. as as much as what's going on the field. I think I think they are, but again, let, let's stress these are st these are still early days, and we're talking about yeah. them as grand final winners. They've been to two grand finals and lost them as well. And, and look, Tony Smith is a guy with his feet on the ground, and, and we'll, we'll ensure that's the case. But at the moment, you know getting towards that halfway point but they look the team to what, beat. What's interesting is we can talk about some of the other teams where they've lost one key player and it's derailed them. So you look at Widners over the Easter period, they didn't have Kevin Brown, they lose three matches. Mm. Uh, Robert Lewis not at, at Salford, they're not quite as effective. Uh, we're going to withdraw Chris Sandow from Warrington for probably four to six weeks. I don't think it's going to have that much effect on them. As brilliant as he's been, I think they can cover that, and that's the difference. That's why they're the front runners this year. Yes, yeah, Stefan Ratsford will come in there, but just going back to the Tony Smith scenario, he's got a quality assistant there <laughs> in Richard Agar. He's brought him in for a reason. He's done his apprenticeship now. Don't be so. It wouldn't surprise me if Tony <laughs> Smith. It wouldn't yeah. surprise me. <laughs> You're not his agent he, by any chance. Right? Challenge, it wouldn't surprise me if Tony says, "I put left it in good hands. Richard could take over." And I maybe go to St. Helens and bring back the happy Tony, days there. Tony can be a director of rugby at Warrington and work three no, days I a week. No, I think he wants a day-to-day -day job. He, he wants to be involved and he wants to see things uh, well, happen. We obviously can't get inside his mind and, and, and you suspect that it will be his decision, which is a good place mm. to be in, isn't yeah. it? You know, if you're a coach, it's going to be his decision whether he stays or whether he goes or not. Um, one thing he, he, he was talking about a lot recently, and this seems to be gathering more and more momentum, is the whole Easter period. We saw Wigan-Warrington yeah. game on the back of an Easter period, which was unusual high quality, because normally we associate that week after Easter with being low quality. I think Jamie Peacock's come out this week saying, you know, Easter's asking too much. So are we now moving towards a position where we no longer have the two Easter games? Well, it's teams? happened before. It happened in 1998. We only had one Easter game over that period and uh, the, there wasn't an outcry. Um, again, it comes down to duty of care. It's something that is banded about in the sport and Easter is full of contradictions. We have this, this ruling that says if you're playing on a Thursday, you need five days' notice, but we're quite happy for you to play two games in four days over Easter, three and eight over the full Easter period. Um, we're, you know, we're responsible for this. As fans, we're, we're demanding these games. I think there's a groundswell of opinion now, seeing some polls on social networking, comments where people are saying, actually, I'm not sure I do want to go and see all these games. The, there is an issue about the fact that the game is responsible for people like Daryl Goulding having to retire with concussion at the age of 27, that Luke Robinson's had to have a hip replacement in his early 30s. The game has changed, no matter what people like Gary say. The move from part-time to full-time over 20 years has changed the goalposts. We are at the moment bystanders in a car crash and it's not right. I think there needs to be some study on this, but one of the most worrying elements, whether Easter plays a part in that or, or not, is just the number of injuries. If you look virtually yeah. every squad in Super League, they are, they, I mean, look at Casford, they went into the game against Huddersfield without 10, Wigan were missing seven, and they're not unusual. Well, that, that is 13. Exactly. You know, every club is suffering and there's got to be, as well as this duty of care, I think there's got to be now some real study into just the level of injury number of injuries we've got. Tommy Makinson, he's already out for the season and he's not alone in that. It yeah. just seems this season, it's, it's, it, it feels yeah. more, more casualty, less Super League at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what we don't want is the team that ultimately does win the title is the fittest team rather than the best team. The other thing about Easter as well, the Easter Monday fixtures don't excite you. You know, I mean, it's rugby league matches and you go and watch because it's a rugby league match. But the Good Friday fixtures excite you because they're all the derbies. The Easter Mondays almost feel like an add-on. So can't we stretch the Good Friday, the Thursday night Good Friday game. Can't we stretch that over the whole of Easter? Well, I guess you can do, but uh, I think at the time it's just making excuses. Before the season comes out, we know it's in the calendar. We know we've got to get on with it. 
teams have got squads of between 25, 30 players. And quite clearly, pick your best team on the Good Friday, give you a chance that the lads who haven't played on the Good Friday, the Monday game, and then bring them back again. I just think it's an excuse for mine. You know, I don't see anything wrong with it whatsoever. I think it's a, well, bit, like, it's a bit like the Grand National this, this weekend. You know Beaches Brook is coming up, and yeah. it's how you it's how you manage, manage that. And if you look at the three clubs who went through the mm. Easter period with three wins, Wakefield, Hull FC and Catalan's Dragons would all say they we've, had, we've had good weeks, yeah. we've had yeah. good Easter's. They, 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 they know it's in the calendar. But Get we, on with it and stop mourning. We That's don't mine. want to hear coaches coming out saying players can't train. They're needled up to go out there. We we as a sport have to look after our players. They are our greatest asset. There is a, there is a case for saying you could have Super League on Friday and Saturday. You could have Championship games on the Sunday and Monday. Link Super League fans in with Championship like Batley do. Five pound entrance fee for a Super League season ticket holder, a drop to championship fan, spread the audiences out but preserve the players. Well you could do, you can spread the audiences out by having the round over over uh, Good Friday through to Easter Monday, that's what the NRL do and they do, do mm. it successfully and take and a round out would go and up. take a round out I mean bring it down to 22 but if somebody's got to pay a price each year you've, the clubs have got to be sensible and think well we're going to miss out one year but we'll get but the money the back another year. people paying the price of the players and again it affects the end. there's a big debate at the moment about the quality of Super League and we've got a lot of entertaining games because they're close and that's fine but have we got a high standard have we got a standard at the end of the year that is going to win England a series is that what we should be aiming for because if it is those Easter Monday games and the majority it's not just of the Easter, third it, game it's not just Easter though is it Phil it's the fact that, that we bring the Super 8s and the, and the 8s qualifiers mm. in and there's even more games Absolutely. So we've got 30 matches this year and, and bringing in the 10 metre rule in 1993 changed the way the sport is played. We've now got full time athletes playing at that 10 metre rule and the collisions are such that we are asking more of players than is physically possible at the moment and that didn't happen in your day. No, 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 they were tackling in our day, you know, and, and they were proper scrums. Wasn't, wasn't and they, and, 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 and they, were, and they were proper scrums. The, the speed you know, and muscle so. where you didn't uh, have it these days. Tick and pass in your day, Gary. Um, right, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you who never, well, you didn't, you didn't do much tackling, did you? Uh, you did a bit of tigging, but not much tackling. Um, um, I, I'd say you've not had a happy Easter, you've not had a happy year at all. Leeds, mm. and you watch Leeds, Phil, week mm. in, week out. Um, is it as simple to say, Sinfield, Peacock, Luluai gone? Hence, that's what you've got with Leeds yeah, now. It's, it's the most elusive commodity in sport, confidence. Um, and it's draining away, and it's, it's within a team that hasn't experienced a losing run. And, and as, as Gary will tell you, any player tells you, you can either be on a winning run and everything goes for you in a losing run, and you, you start becoming individuals and trying to solve problems yourselves. Everybody talks about one percenters. The difference between winning and losing on the field are those... Do you play the ball correctly? Do you have the right people in the right... Well, there's some off-field one-percenters that are affecting Leeds at the moment, which would sound like excuses, but if you add them all up, they are an issue. One is obviously the players that they had injured on the back of those three leaving. So you didn't want to be without your Jamie Jones Buchanan at the start of the season, certainly your Danny Maguire, yeah. because you've lost three leaders, and those are your next generation of leaders. The training base has now been identified as an issue. And what it is, it's a work environment. These are people of routine. This is where they go to work every day. And if for six months you're told you've got to live in temporary accommodation, it does throw that out. Mm. It's not the issue, it's just an issue. And, and I guess the problem is that um, they haven't got continuity in their team at the moment. And Phil, is it winning fatigue? Well, are, are, I was are they say just the very too last sated? One are they just sated? Where we talk it's about the treble, are they sated in terms no, well, of success? It's, it's the Everest principle that you climb Everest and you come back down and somebody says before you take your boots off again and you even assess what you've done we'd like you to climb Everest again and in any walk of life I think there is a psychological hangover. Yeah but I mean other they clubs, will not other clubs don't. I mean we're getting the 80s and 90s did it back to back every year so I'm, I'm not they I'm were, not buying They Manchester were fully United. professional well, that's, that's, that's and they only fully professional team. They had a yeah, squad of about 30 players they could rotate. But I, I think, I, I think you, you, you know, at professional sport, you should be able to do that. You should. And that's a coaching issue, etc. But, I mean, Zach Hardegger kicks a late, late penalty against Warrington. They get a point mm. from that game. Bofaloon goes inside instead of outside yeah. against Wakefield. They'll probably get two points from that game. I mean, it could have been that 1% is, is the difference. It is, it? And, uh, and at times me and Phil have had big uh, arguments and debates, this, but um, it's, it's quite clear. It's not just a confidence situation. But you mentioned, OK, the big three have gone, but... And I tipped before the season started, Leeds again could do the treble because the motivation should be for these players. You know, well, we're going to prove to everybody that we're not going to miss Kevin, we're not going to miss Peacock, we're not going to miss Lulawai. But unfortunately, 
Um, they seem to be sulking. And this all what leads her in. They're not just in a hole, they're nearly at this bottom of the hole. They're sulking, they're lacking confidence, and now they're trying to make excuses. Supporters won't have that. I know the Leeds Rugby League fans as a whole. They will not, they will not have that. So what the players have got to do, they've got to start realising now, yeah, as individuals and collectively, look themselves in the mirror and say, we're better rugby league players this. Why are we in this hole? Because it, there's only them who can come up with the answers to these questions. Because at the, this moment in time, the forward pack are pretty soft. Cuthbertson's rubbish, Galloway's rubbish, Falloon's rubbish, Garbutt's rubbish, Abbott's been out a, a, a little bit, Jamie Jones is coming back. But then when you look at that back line, when you look at that back line, it's still a quality back line that can score tries. But there's no creativity, there's no leadership, and so until they start sorting these out, and sort it out very quickly because they go to Salford this week, and Salford had a better team this year. With Louis back, Robert play, Lewis likely to they're, be back. They're yeah. a better team this year, so what Leeds have got to do now, whatever team meetings they're having this week, and whatever training sessions, or wherever the training field this week, they've got to decide, this is when our season starts. Because if not, then they've got whole Saints of Warrington. If they don't beat Salford this week, I can't see where the next win's coming from. Yep. So Leeds players have got to take responsibility. Yeah, but Stop but looking it, for excuses. It's, well, it's, it's more than that, I think. Yeah, let, let's just Chris the last word on this, because we've got a minute left. Have they blown it now in terms of top four? Have they blown it in terms of top eight? Or would you still expect them to see them in the playoffs? I don't think they are. I don't expect them to see them in the playoffs at the moment. Uh, certainly not at the moment. Can they rescue it? Yes. But when are they going to get started? Well, this weekend, really. In the next, next two or three weeks. Unless they do, the champions, the treble winners of 2015, who we've lauded and applauded, quite rightly, uh, could even be facing could even be facing it was extraordinary Chris, the, rhino, the, rhino, the rhino season the challenge cup's coming up for them in the next round the rhino season could be gone in may say for instance if they go to warrington or go to the black and whites their season could be finished it's interesting that huddersfield are the other team that are in this situation paul anderson has said we're now not even looking at the top uh, top yeah. four we're looking at avoiding but the maybe bottom. that's the beauty only, maybe that is the beauty of the well, system at the same we time we have certainly got a different story in yes. 2016 yeah, this is what we want okay well we'll leave it right there we're going to be back with more of something similar but very different in just a few minutes time Welcome back to the Ark in Headingley, where the chat just goes on, as long as it's about Rugby League. Um, right, well, not just about Rugby League this last week, because we've seen a couple of signings from Wigan moving out. Dan Sargison going to the Gold Coast Titans, and uh, Josh Charlie going to Sale Rugby Union. Should we be concerned about that as a sport, do you think? Yeah, I, I think we should. Um, I think there's a, a big debate about the salary cap, which is as much about retaining players as bringing new players in. Um, I can't imagine why Dan Sargent would want to go to the Gold Coast. No. Multi what what, what I, would attract a Dan young, A young man to go and live yeah. in that part of Australia. On a big salary. Yeah. Where, where's the temptation? So I don't think that's a salary cap issue. That no. might be a lifestyle one. Charnley to sale is an interesting one because obviously he fell out with Wigan last year and uh, wasn't played a lot. Uh, played very well this year, it has to be said, when he's brought back into the team. But yeah. I don't think there'll be too much sleep lost at Wigan with him leaving. Uh, Manfredi is obviously an heir apparent but they lost Joe Burgess last year the worry for me is that we are still it's not a drain I mean every, all of these headlines are drain to rugby and it's not it's the odd player yeah. majority come back it's just the fact that clubs don't have the ability to retain everybody because they're hamstrung by a salary cap and as a sport we want to keep our best young players if we can Sargent's really interesting because obviously graduated through the London system uh, and there still is a feel, which again, I know Gary isn't going to agree with, that if London had been able to keep all the players they developed, because they now have at least 17 players who were playing within Super League at a very high level, and they were playing in London, and they'd had a dispensation and stayed there, we would have a different London scenario. So I think the game needs to look in a lot of ways about what it wants from its players. You know, if we want to keep young lads, they get to the age of 19 or 20, what is the incentive? The wage that they're being paid under a salary cap is not sufficient to keep them in the sport. Mm. So we do need to look at that. I mean, there's a lot of young kids on peanuts, isn't there? I mean, yes, and that's the issue. Yeah, yeah they are, but uh, I guess from a point of view, Sargison uh, is an international now. He's proved that. So for mine, I think we should have 20, 25 players in our English because then it'll do our international chances a lot better. So Sargison, yeah, go and enjoy it with him. I'm sure he will do. Josh Charlie, mm, I'm a little bit... Um, confused with that one because as we all know what happened with the Sam Burgess scenario we know what's happened over the last three or four years 
with league players going and coming back into rugby league. Josh Charlie will be back in rugby league in, in two years' time. Uh, he won't enjoy that uh, experience, he won't get the service, he won't be scoring the tries, and one thing for sure, he's certainly not another Jason Robinson, and for people to say maybe in that England squad, I'd be very surprised at that, so, but one thing, uh, again, Sean Wayne doesn't seem disappointed he's losing Charlie, uh, I don't think Sean's at times uh, been too impressive in fr from a point of view there, but um, yeah, Josh Charlie, maybe uh, taking the money, fair play, but one thing for sure, I don't think he'll be a success, he'll be back in our game in the next two years. Sargent is interesting, because he has said in an interview in, in League Weekly that um, uh, he was put off going to Rugby Union, which was was another path for him, by the the reaction in the media and what happened to Sam Burgess. Well, like so. Uh, like so, so. so uh, that's not put off Josh Charlie from going to sale, and inevitably he's compared with a, with a fellow winger in, in Jason Robinson. What about Chris Ashton? That's a, that's a more, that's, that's a more Chris Ashton direct was, comparison. Chris Ashton was a, a young player on an academy contract who was coming through the system and doing really, really well at playing at fullback for Wigan when Northampton steamed in. At that stage, Chris Ashton was on an academy contract of probably about £12,000, and Northampton threw £120,000 at him. And that was what, 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 what did that. But there, there is an attraction uh, from Rugby Union for certain players, but it's not a, it's not a, a huge drain away that it, that, that it has it been in the past. Is it a geographical but, thing, do you think? Uh, I mean, Sale don't attract a lot of other Rugby Union players. It, it they're, could be, but... Uh, they're the northern heartland. But there's a, guy, the there's, a guy, there's a guy at Sale called Paul Deacon, who <laughs> was part, you know, you know, a, a, a former Wigan player and on the coaching staff, and he's there. He's, he's defensive coordinator at Sale, and he will play some part as well. There is a tradition of Wigan players going there, but but Wigan, you know, we we talk about is the hotbed, the real hotbed of creation, and it, and it still is. And it's this kind of supposition that it will always keep filling the holes mm -hmm. of the Joe Burgesses going, the Dan Sargentsons, and all the rest of it. it. It puts a lot on that system. Like you, Gary, I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't work out for Josh Charlie if he's back in rugby league, like it, so many do take the path back. You say you want 20 to 25 English players playing in the NRL. Mm. Doesn't that just devalue our competition if all uh, our well, stars are playing elsewhere? Well, to be honest with you, Phil, that, 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 that's, that, that, that's tough. The players want to go challenge themselves in the NRL week in and week out against the best week in and week out, but it's only good for our international game. So if our players want to go, it's tough. If it devalues Super League, I'm sorry, but it's tough. It's as simple it's as that. It's the marketplace, isn't it? it? Is. The mar if the it marketplace is. dictates that the salary cap in Australia is twice the size of the salary cap, they've got more spend. Mm. If you're an ambitious player, and you want to even play for England, Greg you probably go to is the classic example. Go to the yeah. N uh, go to the NRL, and you look at the players in the, in the NRL, if not the Burgess the Burgess brothers and James Graham and these. Yeah, and they're the right there at the top, of the, top of the game. Absolutely, and, and we look at uh, Josh Hodgson as well. The, the way that he's playing, but, but you're looking at the we're looking at the quality. Okay, if our British players, our quality are going up there, but why are we not bringing the quality Australians over because here? Because the because the, yeah, but, but, well, well, they won't come anyway. Will they only come when they, the, they're on one knee and the, the, the pass the sell by date and this sort of thing? So we talk about oh, quality. Chris, Chris we're not Sandow, doing it both it? ways, are we? Chris Sandow's exciting us at the moment. Yeah, but that's because oh, he, he got drunk. Because he got Paramatic. kicked out. Yeah, yeah. He got kicked out. Nobody else wanted him in the in the NRL. Matt Gidley was retired. Nobody else wanted him. But yeah, the quality players. But we're still not getting the quality realistically. But there's, there's, what, a, there's, what a, there's a good. There's, 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 the there's a good. There's a there's a, an argument to be made though that young players who are coming through and choosing whether they want to play rugby league or rugby union might just take the rugby league route because they see well you know make an impression at a rugby league club for a couple of years and you could get a dream contact contract in Australia and that might bring more people into our game if or is we, that just being fancy? If we pay them enough because we, we're not paying them even the same as, as apprentices that uh, are out there in industry or uh, graduates that are coming from university. So at 21 you've got to make a decision that is now a lifestyle decision. This is full-time professionalism. This is your job. Mm. If you're going to be paid such a low contract. Brian McDermott said it, didn't he, at the uh, World Club Challenge when he was comparing um, the North Queensland team and, and the fact that Jonathan Thurston on his own was probably on a million pound contract and his two young halfbacks, he mentioned a figure of £32,000. Whether that's right or wrong, that is just a huge chasm disparity. How are we going to keep our young players playing rugby league, never mind whether they're any good at it, if we're not prepared to pay them the market value of young people but how, in employment? How, how, how would we compete though against uh, you know NRL, which has, has a new two billion Australian dollar mm. contract. We don't have that kind of money in the game commercially. We're some way behind some do. of the sports. Some of our owners well, they do. Don't they don't want to spend it. 
don't want to spend it. But they might, but at the moment they don't have to spend it. Because yeah, that's right. But there is dispensation under the marquee ruling, but there still isn't a marquee player. And this, this is kind of highlighted in the championship to, to an extent, isn't it? The fact that we've seen some clubs go professional, but the, the wages they're offering for going professional, players are saying, no, we'll, we'll stay part-time. Absolutely. And Brambani and, and Patch Walker, we mentioned before, the, the, the epitome of that at, at Batley. Batley have benefited because those who've got jobs that they don't want to be professional rugby league players. And it's the same with the referees. Do, do we go back to having a more, a less full-time professional arena then in rugby league? Is there an argument to say that maybe... We, we, we aren't as full-time professional as we are at the minute. Or maybe we've only got sufficient to have, say, ten truly full-time professional clubs. Yeah. That might be the issue with the talent that but we've but got in available. Gary, but in Gary's day, there was only one yeah. full-time professional saying, I, I club. I don't think there. we've got enough players with the sort of talent and quality, Dave, that, um, that allow clubs to, you know, to throw the money about left, right and centre, to be honest with you. There's not enough quality players around. Mm. It's as simple well, as that. Well, most of them are in the south of England, like Dan Sargent and Phil, let's not go down the London route. You know exactly what I think about rugby league in London. And you, you mentioned that well, 17, you, 17 you quality were, players. You were at Castleford. Hold on, seven, seven, no, no, you were at 17 quality week. players. How long have been in now? 36 no, no, no. years. You, Only 17 quality you, players. You, you, would be you retired were, by now. They, so you they haven't been full-time players. professional for 30 years. You were at Castleford last week. Player of the match, Mike McMeekin. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree come with that. The, come through the system. Yeah, but how many? Yeah, but how many? How, how many is coming through? Well, you know? enough now to have a. But, yeah, I think I think there's a real. I think there's a. There was a real. There, you yeah, know, absolutely. you've got your Sargisons, your McCarthy, Scarsbrooks, your Tony Club. Clubs, you know, Kieran Dickens, oh, Kieran Dixon. So so and but but the, the point is that is that that is the that that's is the, the tip of the iceberg. Well, let's look at another one, Tom Johnson. Yeah. The great story of Easter. The the. Stunning form of Tom Johnson, not just on attack where he's got a wonderful sidestep and speed, but Easter Monday on Headingley, three one-on-one -on -one try saving tackles that effectively won the game, becoming a complete all-round player. Tom Johnson's background is in football. He was a footballer until he was, he was a about sprinter as a kid, yeah, wasn't he? Was but, but about 15, athlete. his sport of choice was football. Yeah. We've turned him into arguably the most exciting young player we've got at the moment. There have got to be other players like that that we as a sport well, can attract. Jermaine McGill, for another example, get of that them as well. if we pay at least. Kevin Ward, Kevin Ward was a footballer. Remember Kevin right. Ward? He was a footballer. But we've got, got to be, we've got to be innovative of where we, we get our players from. We've got to be but innovative. Pay them. But we, yeah, but also we've abandoned London, maybe. Oh. We, we've abandoned the south of England. Uh, th this rich possible feeder bed has been abandoned. Mm. Um, all, well, all but the, you know. the other thing that is abso absolutely <laughs> bonkers, and I can't get my head around this, is that some teams have got A teams, some teams no. have got reserve teams, surely not, <laughs> and other teams don't. Some teams want under 18s and reserve teams, other teams just want to run under 20s. Under and you've got, you've got, we've got these clubs in Super League who can't even agree on whether we should have under 18s and a reserve team or under 20s or whatever. Under 23s. Is What's the going answer. wrong? Yeah. What, what, I mean, why is that not being well, sorted? Well, unfortunately, again, it's, it comes down to finance, doesn't it? That's, that's the main reason. That's the reason why it was scrapped. And, and that's, well, some of them want it now because some of the players want to stay in that system. You know, some of the players don't want to be, be uh, dual regged out. They want to feel as though they're part of that club. And that's why, was it? Warrington have got it, St. Helens and Wigan. They don't want to be shipped out to Workington or go to Rochdale or these sort of places. They want us to be part of that club. But until we get it all right from the uh, the short, the, the small level, from, from the kids coming up there, then unfortunately, we're not going to be anywhere near where I we should I be. I think dual registration is an issue. And there is a wider... It's a massive issue. No, there's a, a wider issue. debate about feeder clubs. Yeah. Um, Jordan Lilly, for example, exactly. was man of the match for Featherston this I, last week. But I was just going to mention Jordan Lilly there. You know, we talk about confidence with the Leeds players. What confidence must Jordan Lilly have now? You know, if, if, feel, if No, it, it feels as though it should be the Leeds number seven. There's no doubt yeah, about but that. But he hasn't it, learned and, his trade yet. And, and, and he should be. Well, he won't, he won't be learning his he trade He will, because he's playing against Featherston. men but at Featherston in the championship. He can do that championship. Championship. Team. He can do yeah. an eight. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, in, in the Leeds That's where in this hinterland between the two. He doesn't want to be at Featherston. He feels as though now, at 19, 20 years of age, he's ready for first team football week in and week out. And his confidence, his confidence will be shot because he wants to be no, playing in the packed house. His confidence Edinburgh. will be built because he's leading a team of men around the pitch and well, he needs well, to go through that. Why can't he do that, that at Leeds in the Leeds system playing with well, an 18? And we're looking at, again, the drop-off of players at age 19 because yeah. professional sides are now being asked to make a decision on a player 
when he comes out of the academy ranks. Where is he going to play or are we going to keep him? And the danger is not even that we're not keeping them, is that we lose them to the game. That's they it. don't go yeah, back exactly. to their community club. We, we are becoming a finishing school for rugby union if we're not careful. Well, that's it. We, 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 we have so few players and then we waste them. Mm. We cut them off at 19 and we abandon them and goodness knows where, where and, they and end up. And I'll tell you what as well, we mentioned like with the overseas players and young Baldwinson at least, Jordan Baldwinson, who's not a bad player, you know, and, but he looks at the way Galloway's playing, the way that Cuthbertson and Garbutt's playing, he's be thinking, well, why aren't they being dropped? If I was playing at that consistently for two or three games, I'd be dropped and that's why he's at Feverson. So why isn't Baldwinson now? Because he may being not given, be ready to play at that being, level. Well, Mal if, if he's not, if he's not given, been allowed to Malala's play and, and, and express that there, yeah. then uh, he's not going to get the opportunity. But, you know, so, but why aren't these players being dropped? Because they're out of form and give a young English front rower an opportunity to prove himself. And the easy way to cure the finance system, to say, oh, it's all a question of money, the easy way to do that is for Red Hall to say, all right, here's your, your Sky money. Yep. If you're not running an A-team, you don't get as much. Or we're taking £100,000 out of your Sky money and putting it into but an Dave, 18. But Dave, <laughs> but Dave, that's joined up thinking. And the Rugby Football League doesn't seem to be into that at the moment. Well, clearly at that level, they're not. Because at that level, we've got some teams who are running reserve mm -hmm. teams, some teams are running under 20s, and never the twin will be. And, and the other issue, of course, is that we've got effectively a 25-man squad, but we're now playing more games. So clubs need to hoard numbers 26 to 30, who are the young kids who aren't being paid very much, for the injury crisis we've just talked about. But, 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 but short term, so you can't let but, them go out on loan because you're going to need them. Short term thinking has it been is. rugby league's mm. problem for the last 100 odd years mm. and it shows no signs of ending unfortunately. I think OK I had three players who were 17 playing against Wigan and that's, that's almost, you think, well needs must from Hulk KR's point of view. But I think the NRL have a ruling, you can't make your debut Absolutely. until your 19th year. You've got to be 18 plus. And that's a reflection of the physicality of the game. We're throwing 17-year-old kids yeah. into a big physical game like that. And that's against why you can't the play them every week. They have to learn their trade. They have to bulk up. They have to. It's a mental thing as well. It's not just the physical side of things. It's the fact that you're intense in training every day, full time. You're then getting absolutely battered you're into recovery, yeah. you, you, you need to learn how to do all that and you can't do that every week in Super League. That's the difference be between now and your day, I would say, Gary. You know, you, Sean Edwards makes a, his debut as a 17-year-old um, and Andy Farrell, I think, was 12 when he made his debut for Wigan, as Silver yeah. Legend says. But these days, it's the intensity of the training which is even more intense than the games were in your day. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. well, I'll tell you, like, but <laughs> again, you mentioned from my day, I, I was only 18, Lee Crooks was only 17, I think Ellery Enley was only 18. But were you and, doing and, full and physical and contact and in training, day in, day well, out? Well, that's when, because we all know the kangaroos in 98 changed everything, they brought the tackle bags and the tackle shoes. Yeah, so of course we was doing, of course we was doing contacts. OK, we was only training three times a week for that's Tuesdays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturday mornings, but it was still a physical contact game and we, and we was doing... The, bo them the body them, shapes them, them sort of training. Yeah, the body shapes. There was, there was a study done so in Australia thing. where the average weight of a halfback was 75 kilograms about 10 15 years ago it's now 90 We're talking about halfbacks yeah well that's where they can't play them but you didn't have to um, counter that when you were playing oh, and there's less space to play in as well, well. so let, the collisions hey, are more intense let, let, let's not forget here rugby league was started in 1895 you still had to tackle you still had to oh, catch yeah, yeah, but you still had changed. to pass and it's support changed. you know still, there's, there's yeah, still but the there, were 70, still there were 70 there. scrums as well in those days well the, the, the scrums were, uh, were quite physical as well if you look at you look at the way it goes there and that was quite physical you, and quite tormenting second as well. row, like second rowers scrums. were not the size of centres and also just on a different point in those days 25 years ago there's a team called Wigan who won everything and the publicity for rugby league was never higher than at that point. Mm. What's your point there? The point was that, <laughs> the, the, the point was that in terms of publicity for the, for the game that we cry out for now, which we demand with, with, with the Absolutely. quality that we you know we have to offer um we, we're not we're not but we're i mean there's a lot there's a lot more to it than that i would say because in those days you'd switch grandstand on and there'd be like three four five million watching wigan yeah. every yeah. saturday tv audiences are dwindling because that's the nature of tv audiences yeah. it's not and, rugby and league. so we have to build it up with excellence and all this yeah that's and, and sa we've got saturation we've got too many games that are familiarity breeding contempt we need to have less games of greater intensity more showcase yeah. But we're not going to get we're not going to get that quality and intensity because we haven't got enough quality around coming into the game. You I will if you played less games, and then you mm. could pay more pl the players. Well, how many games more. would you want a season, Phil? Fifteen games and then the playoffs is that what? Fifteen you, and then into the eights. So you have a twenty-three the round and so then in, round into and then your playoffs there. because right. we've got the Challenge Cup as well to factor into that, where most of the top sides will be playing in the later rounds because well, well, that dynamic. I, I, I can tell you well. this: what the players what the players would tell you 
and, and even from my day, and even from and, and even I, I even know from Roger Millwood and Alex Murphy, they would rather play than train. The I think you can do that in a part-time environment, but train. not when it's your career. They okay. Even well, today's players would rather play than train. We'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. But That's not the Easter. The, whoa. That's the end of the last word, Merchant. That's the end of part two. This is the bit where Gary goes around and drinks everyone's wine while we're not looking at before we come back for part three in just a few moments' time. Welcome back to the ARC for the final part of Back Chat. Um, this is the part where we talk about things NRL and how they relate to Super League, of course. Um, we've seen some fantastic games on the NRL on this channel, Premier Sports, over the last few weeks. But I would suggest that the rematch, the grand final rematch, Brisbane against North Queensland Cowboys, way and above anything we've seen so far. They, 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 they look like grand finalist elect, don't they, those yeah. two? Yeah, that, that is the outstanding game, rugby league game of 2016 was, was that... Uh, uh, grand final repeat and it just lived up to every expectation didn't it and it, yeah. it, it was almost identical other than this time instead of Jonathan Thurston getting the winning drop goal it was uh, Anthony Milford for, for Brisbane but it was a tremendous high quality game those two teams really are leading the way along with Melbourne at the moment uh, and it's difficult to look past I mean Queensland's such a strong uh, you know bastion of the sport at the moment and those two clubs you know Wayne Bennett the England coach the England coach yeah. uh, signed another deal as well with Brisbane so he's going to continue there to about 95 and uh, they, they just look they yeah. just look a, a tremendous outfit again so, is it four points separating 14 teams after five rounds that really is uncertainty of outcome and you mentioned North Queensland and how settled they are they've made just one change so far this season yeah. their pack against St George every single one of the forwards made over 100 metres we don't have packs doing that here Gary Schofield loves a MILF a MILF Anthony Milford the, uh, the number six at, uh, at Brisbane I mean they look, they look a, they're great to watch aren't they they are great and uh, as you mentioned and the reason one of the main reasons when you, when you look at uh, the way Australia are, and I think if you look at Warrington here, the reason, uh, again, Dave, why Warrington are going to win the grand final this year, and I think as well they could do the treble, is because they've got the best halfbacks, they've got the best quality halfbacks and creativeness. And another thing from a point of view, if Wayne Bennett could pick Jonathan first and Cooper Cronk, then England would win the Four Nations and they would win next year's World Cup. So Milford there, when I saw him play last year against Wigan, I thought to myself, hmm. I don't really think he could fit into this Brisbane side. He doesn't look as though he's the creative sort of halfback. Boy, oh boy, how wrong have I been? Yeah. Absolute sheer quality from, from his organisation. He knows exactly when to pass the ball and when to stay over the ball. And also, too, as well, his all-round game. Quite simply, he won't be far off do, putting do a green and gold been, jersey on. Do you think there's been a change in the NRL this year that so often we've looked at it and said it's very formulaic? Uh, yeah. Very predictable. Mm. And yet you're looking at people like Ben Barber now at Cronulla. Yeah. We've got excitement machines at yeah. every... You know, to, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That everyone has got somebody who you would get off your, your seat to go and, and watch. And yeah. also, well, we just mentioned a, a couple of things there about pace. Everybody, from the halfbacks point of view, you look at some of the halfbacks who were playing Super League, some of them are quite slow, but if you look at all the halfbacks there, and most of the fullbacks, they've all got plenty of pace. Yeah. Few, all got plenty of pace. A few years ago, Chris, even you would have opened your, uh, your wallet to have gone and watched Benji Marshall playing, mm -hmm. and he's still playing, but it looks like his future in the NRL is not certain. Um, yeah. you, can you see him over here? Do you well, think he should be over here? Yeah, it's interesting with Benji Marshall and Gareth Widdop. There's a halfback combination. They, they, they didn't look too good at all against North Queensland. They mm. gave them a right to, uh, a right tonking. Um, Benji Marshall, uh, a tremendous player. Well, you know, He's one of those you would pay money to in his heyday at Wests and also playing for New Zealand. Um, would I like to see him in Super League? Uh, of course, naturally. And, and I think maybe we will see him. You know, I think, I think he's one of those players at the back end of his career mm. could do two, two very good years mm. for a club and do exceedingly well. Uh, and more power at the elbow. Of, th those are the players you want to see play. So if Benji Marshall's going to come playing for Super League, uh, any club would want He might solve a problem to. at Huddersfield if they were to decide that they didn't want Danny Brough's services anymore. Yeah. Um, well, 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 to, well, well, to be there, well, to be honest with you, I think Saints have been tested because they need a creative halfback. Leeds need a creative halfback. Wigan need a creative halfback. So I would imagine. Kurt, and you mentioned Huddersfield. Kurt, so Gidley, Kurt Gidley was a fullback, yeah. but he looks an mm. outstanding standoff half. Well, again, uh, again and he's Chris, 33 years yeah, old. Exactly. Well, again, it just tells you about the quality and the intensity of Super League week in and week out, doesn't it? 
New Zealand Warriors up and two running wins, after yeah. the longest longest losing sequence in the NRL suddenly two wins back to back and then they're suddenly looking a very watchable team and they always have been watchable it's just yeah. they've never had that consistency but Sean Johnson back to form mm. if we're talking about halfbacks how could you leave him out yeah. uh, possibly the most exciting of them all when he's on form um, again combinations just they look now as Roger Tuiva Asashek has moved into his new environment Isaac Luke I think you get, you've got the spine of a fantastic team there. I, yeah. I'd be looking for them to be top four material. And the margins year. are so small, aren't they? Even when, when exactly. New Zealand Warriors were losing on this awful streak, and we, they're not looking so good, but the margins are so, so small, mm. and yet they make such a, a, a great difference. Yeah. Yeah, let's not forget here as well, guys, one player who is English is at the top of the Daily M. In Josh mm -hmm. Hodgson, yeah. how well is he playing at Canberra? And even at Ulkis Rovers, he was allowed to play in a way where he could express himself, play what you see, and he's been given that freedom again. And uh, I harp on about this all the time. Let the, you see the difference in Wakefield. Under Brian Smith, boring, robotic. Under Chris Chester, being allowed to express himself, play with that vision and awareness, and to play with a smile on the face. Ricky Stewart said to Josh Olsen, play what you see and look at a good player he's turning that, out to that, be. On a week-to-week -week basis, that's what it's all about. Ricky, Ricky, performance. Ricky Stewart's a good story as well because he's been hammered for two years that his yeah. coaching days were over and now look what he's doing with this almost total rebuild of Canberra. It's been absolutely... I know we, we mentioned in part two about Dan Sargentson, but you look at someone like Josh Hodgson and, and, and the way he's playing and he's right up there, as you say, that those great individual honours, he's, he's leading the way. What, why... What's not to like about to go to the NRL in that respect? Exactly. If well, you're exactly. ambitious, the thing about Sargentson was you would say his best form has been on Australian soil when he went over for the yes. Four Nations mm -hmm. two or three years ago. That's when he made his name. That's Shot when winner. everybody sat back and yeah. went, "Wow, this boy's a centre." Suggest he's never really recreated that form since. And going back to Gold Coast, going back to that NRL environment, might just lift him back to where we. I hope think it's would interesting be. watching Elliot Whitehead develop as well at the moment yeah, in Canberra yeah. because they're now even playing him at standoff for a couple well, of he's games. Back in the second row this and, it, week, and it's worked yeah. for him. Yeah. You know, it, it will have developed his game if nothing else. Uh, and and again, without in any way wishing to be disparaging, because he had a he had a fantastic season. I think he left here looking slightly overweight. But you look at him over there, he's a different athletic beast. Yeah. I'll tell you what as well, as, as, as I keep harping well, on this... Why don't we all look at Gary Scott? And I'll tell you anyway. what, Dave, as well, Chris, and Phil, what I would love to see is, you look, you look at a Jordan Lilly, is get some quality halfbacks going out to NRL and somebody taking a punt and saying, hey, listen, I like this English kid, I'm going to give him a chance at six and seven. Because, as I mentioned before, if we had Ferson and Cronk in that England team, we would be Four Nations champions and we would be the World Cup well, champions next year because the pack of forwards is not an issue, the outside backs with the right service and the full back from there. They did, they we did wouldn't have an issue. Jordan Baldwin, so not everybody works when they're put in that yeah. environment. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm talking about half. I'm talking yeah, about half. I think we need the half backs here. And, and for, we're for we're not going to win anything to, to without there, half backs. To go here. out there and be given the responsibility and enjoying that responsibility, exactly like Josh Hodgson's doing it, he's been the leader. It would be great to see. And if we could get half backs who were creating Creative from an international point Lilly of view, would, we would, be, would be in a feeder club in the Queensland competition. But the, the thing is about the, and the Aussie media, I think that the, the success of the players out there, and, and, and Gary, you were part of a generation who went out there mm. and similarly, you know, did the business. Is that the, the, they see the English game in a slightly different light to watching maybe Super League yeah. uh, and also. Um, uh, World Club Series results. Well, they, see, they see our players right at the top of their game, well, and we have. We've well, got players. The, 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 right the great at the thing that happened uh, for me, Chris, was I was I was uh, went to Balmain and was coached by Frank Stanton. And the words to me were from Frank Stanton was quite simple: "You're here to score us tries. You've got a free roll." He wasn't going to take anything away from my game. All he wanted me to do was get back into the defensive line where I could do. But his man management was quite simple. He put Wayne Pierce out on the right hand side, who did my tackling for me realistically because I was all over the place. But he saw the forefronting. You hate a scorer's try and give me that free roll. And that's what they can see in the English players because yeah. we've always been a little bit more better skillful wise and want to play a little bit well, more I, off the I cuff. Think that and they allow, us, and they allow us to do that. You mentioned the World Club series. What what do we make of Sydney Roosters? Because they came over here and we went. I know, think it's the quality of the NRL. Finished isn't it? top well, of the league last year. It's the quality of the NRL. Yeah. Can't win a game this year. We well, can't tackle. I mean, they, they had the, one of the best mm. defence, if not the best defence yeah. last year. And now they're shipping points left, right, and centre. Um, but just to change the, 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 the drift a little bit, uh, the bunker. Everybody was saying the bunker's fantastic. There's two million or maybe four million that the Aussies have spent on this bunker and the video referee. Seems to be that seems to be like crashing to a, a, a big disaster all of a sudden. Honeymoon's over. I think the first week the average call was 55 seconds before they gave a decision. It's now up to about 70 seconds before they give a decision because there's so much pressure growing on them. Is it time to review the whole video ref situation yes, get rid of and it say, all. look, 
You can't get rid of it all, can no. you? You can't disinvent Mine is, get rid of it all, give the, give the importance back to the referee and let him give what he sees. The touch judges, the communication from there, bring, bring the in-goal touches in more for every game there, get rid of the radio referee and give the important thing back to the officials. Is it, isn't the problem with the bunker that it's now officiating on things that we didn't think it would be officiating on? Well, the and that we're, we're, yeah. 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 we're searching for, for a not perfection there. that yeah. you can't get in sport because it yeah. ruins sport. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's, just, it's, just ext it's just going beyond its remit. It is. Yeah. And the remit of the video reference start was basically, you know, has right. it, it got the ball down over is the Is it a try? Is yeah. it a try? Yeah. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The yeah. trouble is with Super League is that it's not there at every game. And that's been the problem for the last 20 years, is that you have it at televised games and not all, it's either at all games or no but the, games. But it's the trouble now in the NRL is that the referees are now undermined by the bunker. Instead of it being yeah. an aid, yeah. as it was in the beginning, yeah. can you just check it for me? Four screens, 50 seconds, thank you very much. But it's not now the same it's, over here. Referees, you know, they're, yeah, they're, they're going there for There is a, the over-scrutiny of the referees that they're now saying, can you just check whose hand it came off to go into well, the whole thing make about decisions? It, but if, if, if speed is... It, you know, the, the whole thing about the bunker is the speed the process up. If the, the process is now slowing down, mm. then you've got to say that the validity of the bunker, Absolutely. hunkering down in the bunker, is not. It could be bunkum. <laughs> so. Get shot for me. You can tell he writes for a living. <laughs> <can't you? laughs> Rubbish. I think, anyway. Um, <laughs> But nobody, I mean, uh, uh, the fans are the big issue, isn't it? I mean, nobody, no, uh, you know, if somebody, if, if your standoff in a grand final knocks on, or, you know, I mean, we take the Ben Hunt situation, for yeah, example, in the grand absolutely. final, those things happen. We're immensely absolutely. disappointed, mm. but those things happen. So why can't we accept that referees well, might sometimes make a mistake? Those things no happen. No try Let's all up and has ever away. been scored without a player making a mistake. Yeah. Every game would be nil-nil. So make mistakes. Yeah. I'm, I'm more concerned about Semi Radradra. Well, well, we'll get on to him in just a second, but the, the, you can't get rid of the bunker altogether, I no. would say, because you still need the video referee, because we see a lot of spectacular tries being scored by wingers, for example, who know that they've got the confidence to go for it, because if they get it right, they're going to be proved to have gotten it right. Get rid of the video referee altogether, you, you miss those magical moments. Well, I think also, because I was at Casford at the weekend, and the spectacular young Hitchcock, you know, the, the way that he dives over, because mm. he knows now that, you know, the touch is not coming to play from there, but... Uh, but again, the, I think the, the impetus from a point of view with the referee and uh, you know the communication with the officials is all just going there. It's just now where it's frustrating for everybody. And we're just saying here with the bunker but from, what, 55 seconds to 70 odd seconds, it's, it's realistically just being abused at times. Well, we've got being abused by the out, officials. Falling out, falling out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We well, we've, we've heard Ben Fair has <laughs> been dropped this week yeah. because Thierry he Alba. couldn't get it right with, with Terry Elbe, you know. Yeah. So some of the importance has got to come back to the officials. It's the best of inventions and the worst of inventions. Used properly, and you're right, Dave. When it gets to those spectacular tries, when but is it being used down, properly at the moment? No, it isn't. It's not. It's not, no, it's not no, being it's used not. properly at the, the moment. Best of and for me, are the worst I tell you, and for me, I would scrap it and give the importance back to the referee. And Tony, two touches and Tony Smith, and then go Tony Smith, who you, who you say is going to be the next St Helens coach, uh, he agrees with you as well. He wants it scrapped and has, has been consistent. Just that, that point that you bring up there, Phil, yeah. Semi Radrandra, you know, you know, big deal, etc., etc. Fiji. Fijian player looks like Mal Manning is going to pick him from Australia. Well, he's questioning whether he's going to pick him. And, and is that right or wrong? He is shouldn't that, pick him. Shouldn't go anywhere near pick. Well, one of the stated aims of the Rugby League International Federation is to build up teams from five to eight, so that we have genuine competitive international competition. That we're not going to World Cups and already effectively knowing at least three and probably who the four semi-finalists are. Bear in mind that Fiji have made the last two semi-finals as well. Um, so th there is a real pool of talent that should be fed into teams five to eight. If Australia starts picking out the best ones and, and, and choosing them, then they're undermining the fact that the greatest thing we've got to sell to the wider world it, it is not there anymore. But again, it's down, to the, don't need but it's down to the player again, well, though, Phil, isn't it? Well, you know, that... The, Rightly no, or wrongly, he's down, he, to, the, he's no, down no. to the international he, he can make fixtures. No, no I, I agree with Chris because you look at the Nicarima brothers. So you've got one brother who says, "No, I want to play for New Zealand. I don't want to play State of Origin," and the other one says, "No, I'm going to Sydney because I want to play State of Origin and potentially Australia." The player has to make the decision. The player also has to has a set a set of meaningful fixtures that he can play for his nation and be paid to do that. Yep. Because that's the other difference. If you play for Australia and if, and England, you get paid quite a lot. If you play for Australia, not so much. If you play for if you get f play for Fiji, you expect to do community work in the island and be grateful for it. So I think if we're really, really serious about an international calendar, 
um, meaningful World Cups, which are the pinnacle of every sport, then Radrada is a role model for Fiji. He should be paid to play for Fiji in e meaningful it's, it's fixtures simple, every okay, year but it's for simple. Fiji. You, you declare, you play for your country and you can't shift. That's, that's it. The, the, the rules are rules in the that The stupid respect. thing with him is he can't play state of origin because the rules are altered now that say unless you're born in Australia you can't play. But he can play for Australia. Mm. And yet we were told state of origin was a yeah. trial to play for and Australia. Tyson Frizzell falls into that. Wales could lose a very, very handy player with Tyson Frizzell if, if he gets picked to stay, play state but, of origin. But England have done the same. England have picked Michael McAlorum, who's effectively Irish. You know, we need to decide what we want out of International Rugby League. And if we want at least eight strong nations, then we need to come up with a set of fixtures where these guys can play. Bring back the Lions, because we've had meaningful fixtures amongst home nations so that the best are selected. And that improves your, uh, the your rules, skill level the and, and your The rules or lack of rules well. expose the weakness of the international Absolutely. games. That's, that's, Absolutely. that's where we're at, unfortunately. Yeah, in the, absence of current, the current absence of Sam Tompkins, for example, Matty Russell becomes a potential fullback Except for, Scottish. for England. Uh, uh, but he was actually born in Scotland, wasn't yeah. he? He's the, the most Scottish person they've uh, got. And they yeah. are playing in the Four, they, they play in the four Nations this year. Yeah. So that and we need him. Yeah, and, and, and at some point we might even find out when those games and where they're being played. Keith Galloway is Scottish as well. Let's not go there, Phil. <laughs> well, in that case, let's have a look at the fixtures this week. If you don't want to go there, let's uh, remind ourselves of the, uh, the NRL games that we've got coming up this weekend. Some uh, real mouth-watering ties as well. Uh, Friday, just the one game on the Friday, 10.30, live on this channel. Uh, that is the Rabbitohs against the Roosters. These are all the reversal games from the opening weekend of the NRL. Saturday, three matches, the Eels against the Raiders, the Warriors against the Sea Eagles, and the Panthers against the Cowboys. And then on Sunday, we've got uh, two matches for you. The Sharks against the Titans at Shark Park. And the Knights against the Tigers. Uh, that's at the, uh, the Hunter Stadium, next to some very nice vineyards, I seem to remember. And on Monday, uh, 10 o'clock, live, it's Melbourne Storm against the Canterbury Bulldogs at Amy Park. And don't forget, you can check all the, uh, the details of those fixtures and all the other rugby league stuff that goes on on Premier Sports at the website, Premier Sports, don't forget the S, premiersports.tv, www.premiersports.tv. From myself, from Gary Schofield, from Phil Kaplan and from Chris Irvin, thanks for joining us and we'll see you again in a fortnight's time.